the plane and put Baba down in his seat and then came down again and Baba said, he doesn't know how fortunate he was. It was such a sight because Baba looked like such, I mean that man was such a huge individual with these big bulging muscles, you know, that Baba just looked like a feather being carried in his arms like that and he did it so beautifully taking him up, I mean gently, not roughly or anything like that. It was really a sight. So at least when I got to Karachi and I was able to hand Baba over safely to his Baba lovers, I had the satisfaction the next day of seeing that they were not able to get all the six seats together. First, Baba went, four of them went with, three of them went with Baba in one plane, and the next day after that, Miru and I had to come on another plane. They couldn't get the six seats together. The uh, Blue Bus tour took place in 1938, and uh, now, after all these years, I forget just how many months we were traveling around, <clears throat> but then, in the end, we came back to uh, uh, Meribad, and we spent a number of months in Meribad, and then again, in August 1939, we started on the second Blue Bus trip and uh, came down to Bangalore. We stayed in a very beautiful big bungalow there that overlooked the uh, golf links. And part of the property was uh, closed off for Baba for his mus. And at that time, Baba had some very wonderful mus there, like Chedi Baba and uh, that one they call the Fulwala, who used to put flowers in his hair. And uh, Eric, I believe, was in charge of the mass at that time, and he has many stories to tell about the mass. And at that period, when we were in Bangalore, Baba used to have us entertain him every now and then with uh, skits, which Mani used to write. And we had one really very elaborate and marvelous one, which uh, was laid in an African jungle. I was stage director and had to sort of rob the garden of all the leaves and branches and uh, shrubbery so as to make it look like a jungle. Then we built a thatch hut and then a big cauldron where the cooking was to take place. And the, the, uh, because it was a tribe of uh, uh, meaty, what do you call it, uh, cannibals. And uh, all the different members of the household took part. And uh, they all had to be blacked up from head to toe, uh, like Africans, and the women wore grass skirts. And uh, Katie was the chief with a very fantastic headdress and looking very ferocious. In fact, we had made a piece, cut a, piece, a loaf of bread to look like a roast chicken. And Katie was eating that roast chicken so violently. Katie was Dr. Gahir's sister. And she was eating that uh, roast chicken so violently that she drew blood because she bit her finger. <laughs> and Margaret did a witch doctor's dance, which was really something unique. And my, I had two parts. I was a Britisher with his wife who were captured. And my wife was very plump and very tender. And the cannibals were licking their chops while they were heating the cauldron and thinking what a nice juicy bit that was going to be. But they rather looked askance at me because I was too skinny to be taste very good. My second role in the play was the tiger in the jungle. And uh, we happened to have moved everything down from Meribad because at that time Baba said we were going to live in Bangalore. So all the furniture had been moved down, including this tiger skin. So I put on the tiger skin and did a, a, a loping uh, a sort of, uh, what might you say, prowl through the stalking. jungle. Yeah, stalking through the jungle. And the, the, uh, all the cannibals with their spears were uh, following me I'm going to do a, a spear uh, act on me and, and annihilate me. The whole thing was done as sort of you know, as like a choreography so that it was very effective. And uh, the, jung the, the tiger weaving his way through this greenery and shrubbery of the jungle. That was one thing we put on. Another one we did was uh, something that Norina wanted to do, which was supposed to be, uh, I mean, the things we did were so opposite in, in, in uh, 
content. I mean, it was like a cannibal scene and a jungle scene. And then what Narina put on was uh, a scene of Christ carrying the cross, going to Calvary. <laughs> but it was very effective. First they had the nativity, and Margaret was supposed to be one of the angels, and I was Joseph, and it was all very effective. We had a whole week of doing a series of things. There was one scene that we did of uh, a very a fantastic thing coming, uh, taking place in a madhouse with all the inmates, bad people. And of course, the dialogue was very funny. So that way we used to, every now and then, <coughs> put on something for Baba's entertainment. And not only there in Bangalore, but throughout our, I might say, life with Baba, every now and then Baba would have us put on something uh, sometimes in the spur of the moment, sometimes he would give us weeks or only a matter of days ahead. <clears throat> One time uh, we did uh, a skit in which I had to take the part of an old Parsi priest. And actually I was very sort of shaky in my movements being a very doddering old man. And the scene opens with me reading a Parsi paper, a Gujarati paper. And uh, naturally, being old, my hands would shake. So the part was complete with shaking hands. And the thing is that nobody realized at the time that that shaking was real, because I was so nervous at the fact of acting before Baba that the, the, the shaking of the hands was just something I could not control. But it uh, was in keeping with the part, so everything worked out all right. There was another time when uh, Baba just on the spur of the moment said, you have to do a play in another day or two. So I told Mani, I said, look Mani, every time I have to talk a part in a language that's not my own, and I can't memorize it in one day. So what you're doing this time is a village scene, uh, one of these Marathi villages. So uh, my part being the shoemaker, I will just be the deaf and dumb shoemaker with a club foot. So I had a grand time. I had a very swarthy face. I had a club foot, and I looked very gruesome. And I could go through the most beautiful gestures I wanted to and didn't have to worry about a part. And so for days afterwards, Bobby used to make me walk around with a club foot just for his entertainment. <laughs> these, these plays that we used to put on like this were always written by money. And uh, just a few of us of the group would act in them. But uh, Baba always asked us to do them because he said that it lightened his mood, especially at some time when he might have been working rather seriously. And this sort of lightened the whole atmosphere. And so we always tried to put on something for Baba which would be of a, a comic nature that would make him laugh. And he really did enjoy all the things that we used to put on. In fact, there were times sometimes when Baba would laugh so much that he'd have to hold his face because naturally not being able to uh, express that la laughter outwardly, he just, his face would hurt. So then we would try to soft pedal what we were doing so that Baba's face wouldn't hurt too much. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the Meribad, let me see, we were in Bangalore. Hmm. So from Bangalore, we returned to uh, Meribad in about 1940. In 1941, Baba was in seclusion in Meribad. Then I'm a bit vague about the dates, but I know that we spent part of the time in Panchgani, some part in Mamdishwar, then back again to Meribad. And uh, in 1946, Baba decided to uh, close the ashram. And uh, ostensibly Kitty and I were supposed to be going back to the west, but later Baba called us to join him where he was in the north. And uh, Margaret was temporarily there with us because Margaret had come to Bangalore as soon as war broke out. Baba had given Margaret strict instructions to uh, join him when war broke out. So she came to Bangalore in uh, 1939, end of 1939. And uh, while we were in Bangalore, <laughs> so 
So while in Bangalore, Nani had been having before that quite a touch of arthritis, which affected her hands and her feet very badly. But uh, she was always very stoical about it. And uh, in fact, she was almost sort of taking a turn for the better. And we were going to go down to Mysore from Bangalore with Baba for the Dasra celebration. And uh, Nani was even taking an interest in what I should pack for her and all that. And suddenly, her health took a turn for the worst, and suddenly, the uh, first thing I knew, she was, one night she was not well, and the next morning she was in an oxygen tent. And she was like that for almost a day and a half. And uh, her last day, that particular day, Baba had gone out from Bangalore. And when Baba came back that evening at seven o'clock, the doctors, who were both Dr. Duncan and Dr. Nero, said that Nani had just died. Baba went into the room, and Nani's eyes were still open. And uh, Baba closed Nani's eyes, and I was conscious of the fact that as she closed her eyes, she gave a sigh, and at, after that, I felt this was only a shell there, that Nani was no longer there, she was with Baba. And uh, all through Nani's life with Baba, which was really a very short one considering, uh, Baba treated her always as somebody very special and very much, a, you know, he never put her through the tests and the trials and the, the needling and all the things that he did with us. Somehow or other, Nani was, had no need of that. And Baba himself, of course, was the first one to know it. And he just, as I say, treated her as something special. And after he died, then he said that she had, he had given her mukti. So it was shortly after that that uh, then Margaret came. As war broke out, just about, Nani died on the 14th of October, 1939. And Margaret came just the end of October. And I think, uh, oh no, it must have been November because war broke out on the 3rd of November, didn't it? Mm. And she had quite a, a, a f amazing time in trying to arrange to come here because for an English person to want to get out of England, at the time when the war had broken out, was a feat. And, uh, but somehow, Baba had said, you come, so she managed it. And one reason that helped her was that she had to chaperone Rustam's young son back, who had been in school there in England. And uh, she just coaxed this official that she had to get him back, and it was very important to get this young son back to his parents. and. Naturally, through Baba's grace, she managed it, and she got here. And she said it was quite a trip having to uh, travel with, uh, because the, all the boats had to have, uh, there was a sort of, what did they call them in those days? When there was a whole group of boats. and then convoy. They, yeah, but the convoy. She said it was really quite something. So, from Bangalore, we were to go back to Meribad, in spite of the fact that while we were in Bangalore, Baba had all the furniture from Meribad sent down because Baba said, now we will settle in Bangalore and Meribad will be closed. So after eight months in, in Bangalore, all the luggage, I mean all the furniture which had been brought, had to be taken all back. So you can imagine the state of the furniture having moved down once and being brought back, especially in uh, Indian uh, freight trains. And uh, so it was decided that we should go back, naturally, by bus. Well, there were, of course, so many of us in uh, Bangalore, that, uh, and with so much luggage and the animals, we'd acquired quite a menagerie at the time. Uh, they were all going to have to go back by train. So Kitty and I again went through one of these strange things that we did every now and then, and uh, we suggested to Baba that uh, we would go back by train if he would like, 
that it would make more room for others in the uh, bus, and we really didn't mind if we had to go back by train. And if we went together, it would be all right. We'd keep each other company. Oh, said Baba, you want to go back by train. You don't want to travel with me. You prefer going back by train. No, Baba, that's not what we mean. We mean that everybody else would be more comfortable, and, and we really didn't mind going by train. No, said Baba, you prefer going by train instead of traveling with me by bus. That's how I understand it. And this went on during the whole session when the whole room had been gathered together with Baba. And uh, when the meeting was over, uh, Baba dismissed us. We, Kitty and I were still sticking to our point that we really meant it out of the goodness of our hearts to go to, by train rather than go by bus. And uh, Baba called us to his room. And we went through this whole thing with Baba. And about three days went by and we still were going on, same thing, and then Baba would dismiss us and disgust, you see, that we were still sticking to our point, you see, of what we felt about doing. In the end, of course, we know that Baba has to always win out, and we never have a chance against him. We tried our best, but uh, in the end, we, we had to give in, and we wept, and we said, yes, Baba, of course we want to go with you, of course we don't want to go by train. And then Baba was quite happy and embraced us and everything, all the atmosphere was clear again. So we went by bus and the usual one night stops and packing and unpacking of bus the way we had to do and at last we got back to Maribad. Then uh, I think we were there for a while Baba then, of course, was in seclusion in 1941, and we went for a few months to Panchkani, and then we were a few months in Mahamleshwar, and then again we came to Panchkani, then again we came to Maribad. All within a certain area we were there, until about 19, oh yes, 1945 we went down to Hyderabad. Just the small group, and then Baba called different ones from the ashram on a visit, and then back again. In 1946, Baba decided to close the ashram. And uh, the Westerners were to go back to the West, and certain Easterners were to go back to their homes. Mansari elected to stay in Merabed. Vidal's family was staying in Merabed, also the Dastur family, Kagabad's family. And then instead of, uh, instead of Kitty and me going back to the West, Baba then called us up to where he was being going to be in the North. And uh, from there, we used to take side trips with Baba to different places. Like one time I went with Baba to the Kuru Valley. Another time Kitty went with Baba to Simla. At the same time, Baba used to do bus work in, during those periods. And it also it gave us sort of a change, a nice uh, mirror and money to see different parts of India. And uh, the time when I uh, went with them to Kuru Valley, it was a time when I developed uh, hepatitis and uh, that was very strange the way that happened because I had been given a warning on the way you might say maybe it was Baba's giving me the warning but I just didn't understand it as one but what happened was that uh, when Don and Margaret and Kitty and I were gone north to join Baba we were traveling on a bus and we stopped at a wayside place and they all decided they wanted some sugarcane juice. I wasn't particularly keen, but I thought the others want, I'll have it also. A perfect stranger, a man sitting in front of me, turned around, looked at me, didn't look at the others, and said to me, I wouldn't drink that if I were you. I thought, it's a bit silly, why pick on me? And the others are drinking it, and it doesn't seem to affect them, so I'll take it. I thought nothing more about it. Then, the day we were supposed to leave to go on a journey to go to Kulu, I started feeling but sort of feverish. I thought, oh gosh, I'm coming down with a cold. And in those days, they didn't have the kind of medicines you have now. And there were horrible specifics and things you took to take down fever and things. I took all these different things and nothing worked. Every time the, the medicine would wear off, I'd get the fever again. I was feeling miserable. I could only drink a bit of milk and, and eat an egg. 
and Baba was getting quite disgusted here. He'd taken me on the trip, and I was hardly able to lift the bags or do anything as much as I tried. And so we arrived at a place, which was about the, I suppose, the last stop or so before we got to Kuru. And it was a most charming little bungalow. And when we arrived there, Baba said, I'm sick and tired of this milk and egg you're eating all the time. Now he put a big plate full of, a heaping plate full of rice and curry in front of me and said, you have to eat every bit that's on that plate. At that point, I was feeling too miserable to do anything but just look. So pointed at the plate, said, eat it all. So I ate it all. Somehow it got pushed in. Later on I was sick, but that's neither here nor there, because uh, the main thing was that I did what Baba told me to do, was to eat it. When we got to Kulu, Baba, uh, Duncan said, yes, I had hepatitis. Baba said, what? You can't stay in the house here with us. You'll infect everybody. In fact, you'll have to go back. I saw that long, hot journey back. I was just feeling too miserable at that point to care. I mean, but I just thought, well, I'll never reach the other end. That's much, not that much I know, you see. So at last, Bobby said, well, if Kaka doesn't mind, then you can stay. Kaka being a buddy of mine, of course he didn't mind. But the thing was that he had charge of the cooking and everything, and for me it meant special food, plain boiled and all that sort of thing. So Baba was putting the onus on Kaka. So if Kaka didn't mind, then it was all right. So where, where I should stay? So there was a nice little cow shed where Duncan had a bedroom at the top. And there was another empty room. So Duncan and I had the two rooms at the top of the cow shed. And it was western climate, up in the mountains, and beautiful view of the valley and the snow-capped mountains in the distance. And I mean, for any place to recuperate from an illness, I couldn't, Baba couldn't have picked a nicer place for me. At the time, Duncan, after examining me, said that he had never seen such a light case of hepatitis. And Baba said to me, if you hadn't eaten that meal when I told you to that day, you would have been so sick. So because I obeyed Baba. At the time, Duncan, after examining me, said that he had never seen such a light case of hepatitis. And Baba said to me, if you hadn't eaten that meal when I told you to that day, you would have been so sick. So because I obeyed Baba and did what he said, he mitigated the illness, so that by the time Baba was ready to leave Kulu Valley, I was quite well and strong again and was able to sort of cope with the travel back. While we were in the north, Baba went on many uh, must trips, and uh, then each time he would come back again to the our main stop where we were, which was in Dehradun. Then from Dehradun, we came on to Mahamrishwar and stayed at Aga Khan's bungalow where we always used to stay when we went to Mahamrishwar. And we were there for a few months and then went down to Satara. And at the time we were in Satara, then Norina and Elizabeth, this was 1947, came from uh, America. And uh, they were staying in a separate bungalow from us. Dr. Gohe was looking after them. And Kaka, and they used to come over to our bungalow. We see each other back and forth. At that time, Baba said now nah, he would be coming back to Merazad. But we were not all to stay with Baba. There was, uh, at that time, Katie and Naja and uh, Kitty and myself. Baba put us in a small group on Maribad Hill. It was as if they were uh, all small families. Instead of being one big ashram, we were all like small families. There were the four of us. Then there was Korshed and her mother, and they made a small group. Mansari's family made another group. Vital's family made another group. We each had our own household. We had our own, uh, uh, what do you call it, money in which to make our arrangements of bazaar and everything. And it was like uh, so many small households all in under one roof. And that lasted up to the time when we were uh, going to have the, the new life as a start. Baba had given us a warning 
that there would be a new life period. Oh yes, in the meantime, the main building here at Merazad was opened. And uh, Narina and Elizabeth came to stay here with Baba and the small group which is now here with Baba. But as I say, they were our small families up in Merabad. Kitty and I used to take turns to come here and be with Baba. I would come for a month and Kitty would come and then I would go back. That way Baba kept the contact with us. And sometimes the whole group from here would go to Merabad to spend the day. And then we'd put on some skit for Baba to entertain him and that sort of thing. And this went on up to the time before the new life was to start. And as I say, Baba had given us a warning that he was going to go into the new life and only certain ones of the women would he take with him. So naturally that started our wheels whirling. Who is Baba going to take? Oh, I hope he takes me. But, oh dear, what will happen if he doesn't take me? All these things going in our minds. And uh, Baba would give no indication whatsoever for quite a while. And uh, I think he didn't call us together and tell us till after Narina and Elizabeth left. They left, uh, oh, I think about a month or two before the, the, because it was October 49 when the new life started. I think they must have left in about uh, August or September, I forget now. Anyway, it was some short time before that. So at last, the day came when Barbara came with the group from here to Meribed. And that was the day that he was going to tell us who of the women were to go with him. Of course, we knew that Baba was selecting quite a few of the Mandali and that there would be a big group of the Mandali. But the women group was to be very small. So, throughout our life with Baba, we always used to find that when Baba would praise us in any way, that it usually foreboded ill and there would be bad news in some kind. When Baba used to tell us what hopeless individuals we were, what broken down furniture, why he haven't even bothered to get, collect us and gather them to, to him, uh, we used to relax and say, oh, well, it's all right, you know, Baba's just leading us along, but everything's okay. But when he would uh, tell us, as I say, how wonderful we were, then we were on our toes. So. The East Room that the girls have in Meribad, usually whenever we were living in Meribad, if any conference or any meeting took place, Baba would call us to that room. He would sit on Mary's bed and then we would all sit around on stools. And So that day the meeting was called. And then with money reading the board, Baba started telling us what pearls we were how oh, he wouldn't have done for his master what we had done for him and uh, oh, we were jewels, we were this, we were that and the more Baba laid it on, the more we looked at each other and said, oh gosh, I mean, if Baba will only get on with it, I mean, this is getting us, this, you know, on tender hooks, what is Baba going to tell us and what bad news is he going to present us with? So at last, having told us how wonderful we all were, then Baba proceeded to say who was coming on the trip. And it turned out that there were only going to be four women, Mera, Mani, Meru, and Dr. Gavya. So Kitty and I looked at each other. We felt so disheartened. We had so banked that Baba would take us with him, you know, on the trip. We were really so keen to go. The Baba said no. He had thought about taking us. But uh, for two Western women like us to go on a trip like that and a walking trip to India and uh, there might be difficulty with the authorities, the question, why should these two women be coming along? And I don't know, Baba made a very plausible reason, as he always would, uh, as to why Kitty and I were not going with him. So then, for us, Baba gave us a choice. He said, to Kitty and me, we can go back to our respective countries. His love would always be with us, and we should be happy. Or we could stay in India, but we might never see his face again. So Kitty and I said, well, we're near to Bob in India, we'll stay in India. 
So Baba said, all right, you'll have to stay with Mirji in Bombay. But the Easterners, he just settled it. He's told uh, Katie and Naja that they would have to stay with Anavas and that Katie at some time or other would have to go and find a job. As I say, Kitty and I were to stay with uh, Mirji, and also staying at Mirji was Korshed and her mother, whom we called Masi. And Mansari was to stay on Meribad Hill, and others were, Easterners were distributed in other various places. So, I had had to, before the, I had, before the announcement was made, had to make out a list for everybody as to what particular things should be taken on the new life trip. Only just, you know, say one towel or two towels, so many changes of underwear, so many clothes, so many shoes or sandals and coats and so forth and woolens. So Kitty and I, naturally, we had sort of figured out all the things maybe that if we would have. So even though we found we were going to Maribad, I'm listen to me, India, uh, Bombay, uh, we, we still, and even though Bob said we may never see his face again, we still let, you know, a little thread of hope was there. Maybe Baba will call us. So let's keep one trunk all ready, because if Baba does call us, it'll be at a moment's notice. But just the things that are on this list uh, to go on the trip. So Kitty and I each had our own trunk besides all, because all our luggage had to leave Maribad. Maribad was emptied completely. Whatever was left over there was all the things were sold. Uh, Maribad is now empty, excepting for Baba's things in that east room there. Otherwise, uh, the rest of the west room and upstairs where all the beds and furniture, everything was sold. So naturally our trunks and everything had to go with us to Bombay. So every day, Kitty and I, oh yes, our one re several restrictions Baba gave us. One was don't touch men. Another was that whoever we uh, saw, we should never accept food from them. We could accept liquid refreshments. The Baba people that we went to see mostly naturally. Who else did we know in Bombay accepting Baba people? We could accept liquid refreshments from them. And uh, we should never buy anything on our own. Anything we needed, we should ask Homai for, that Meiji's wife. So, with that little thread of hope still hanging on. Oh yes, by the way, the, when we left that morning in Maribad, Baba came all the way from Marizad to see us off, which, I mean, as wonderful as it was, it sort of even made the departing worse. So, as I say, did you give Baba a, uh, an embrace, a final embrace? Well, how was it? Uh? No, no, he just waved to goodbye to us. He gave us the embrace here. So he just waved to us, as far as I can remember now. I know I know, I got the embrace. I got an embrace here because I was staying here at the time. And, uh, or he may have, because Kitty was staying then in, in uh, Meribad. So he may give, uh, the, now it's, it's, Time's gone by so far that it's sort of a little nebulous that part. But I know I remember yeah, that I remember that wave, and I think, oh gosh, you know. Uh, so every day, Kitty and I used to walk up in the hanging gardens, up different roads. We got we got really to know all that area very well up around where where Mary lived and where the uh, Nanimon and his and Anavas lived, and uh, we loved that atmosphere at Anavas's. So what we used to do, we'd, we'd take a walk in the evening, because we always dined late there at Meiji's, and actually he was away, busy all day and all that, we didn't see much of Homai, because sometimes she'd come and talk with us, but she was never a very sort of uh, outgoing person. And uh, so we would take a walk, always arrange somehow to drop in at Anavas's before we'd return home in the evening for dinner. And that way Kitty and I kept fit and also uh, got our work, got so that we knew our way around Bombay. And we used to go and visit Baba people, Baba lovers. And they knowing that we could not accept anything in the way of food, they would uh, devise all sorts of ways of making things into liquids so that we could enjoy the liquid. For instance, like when it was the mango season, I mean, actually, we couldn't eat a mango, but 
but they would mash the mango into a pulp and then mix it with cream or milk so that we would have it as a nice cold drink which they'd put in the fridge and things like that. And, uh, and we realized that, I mean, Bob had made these restrictions because otherwise people would have been lavishing things on us all the time because of coming from Baba. So time went by till about, this was October, November, must have been around at the end of November, or maybe the beginning of December, anyway, that, about that time, we got a letter from money and that made it final, saying that Baba would not call us, that we should stay at Homai's and Meiji's, and that we should uh, help Homai in the household. And if it turned out that Homai didn't need any help, then we should get jobs. Well, Homai didn't need any help in the house. I mean, she was one of these people that didn't like people, other people from outside fussing with her things. So that meant getting jobs. But I mean, neither Kitty nor I were young women at the time. And Bombay in itself, I mean, the, the, the people themselves couldn't, some of them, get jobs. So how are we foreigners in a foreign city going to find a job? So we went to the YWCA. We went to different consulates. We looked up ads in the newspapers. And we were getting desperate. We said, Papa said, get a job. How are we going to get a job? We can't find a job. We're trying, but we can't find it. So Homai, seeing the state of mind we were getting in, said to Kitty, you used to teach piano, didn't you? And Kitty said, yes. So uh, she suggested that Kitty go down to Queen Mary High School, where her daughter was a pupil, and possibly there might be an opening. And she said, the English woman who is the head of the school there is a very charming woman. And I think that you will, I mean, being also an English woman, you get on with her very well. So Kitty went down there and came back beaming. And I said, Kitty, you got a job? She said, yes. I said, teaching piano? She said, no. She said she's quite satisfied with her music teacher, but she said she offered me a job teaching English. And I said, did you take it? She said, yes. I said, can you teach English? Of course, said Kitty. <laughs> so then, if you know Kitty at all, she had that funny look in the eye, which meant Kitty had been up to something. And I had lived with Kitty all these years in the ashram, not to spot that look. I said, Kitty, what have you been up to? Well, she said, uh, I said, come on, out with it. She said, I told Miss Groom about you. I said, you did what? She said, I told Miss Groom about you. I said, what did you tell her? She said, well, I told her I had a friend who was an artist and she was also looking for a job. I said, Kitty, you didn't. And she said, she wants you to come down and see her. I said, but Kitty, that means teaching. I can't teach. I've never taught. How could I go? Oh, Kitty, how could you done that? She said, well, you need a job, don't you? I said, yes, I need a job, but not not teaching. I said, ah, it's all very well to try to do something on your own, but to go and impart it to others, I mean, you have to have a knack or a feel for it, and I haven't. Kitty kept saying, but still, where is the job coming from? You need a job, don't you? Here's one being offered to you. So I started thinking over, and I said, here's this woman, sight unseen, is offering me a job, and I'm just being like this about it. I mean, th this isn't what Baba would want. So I, uh, I uh, said, all right, I'll go down and see her. And I took my portfolio with some few of the old paintings that I had, and I went to see her, and then and there she offered me the job. And I said, look, Miss Groom, I might as well be quite frank with you. I said, I don't know the first thing about teaching. I have never taught. I have never wanted to teach, but I have got to have a job while I'm here in Bombay. I don't know how long I'll be here in Bombay, but while I'm here, I must have a job. But I said, you're taking me, and you don't even know whether I can teach or not. She said, but I'm, I'm willing to, to take you, and, and I, I want you to come. I said, Miss Groom, I said, the idea of all those pupils, I said, this frightens the death out of me. I said, I, I, I mean, it's bad enough, just a few pupils, but a whole room of 30 or 40 children looking at me. I, I said, I just, my throat will dry up. I just, I, I never can do anything in front of a group. Nothing would stop that woman. She said, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you the best pupil in each class. Will 10 or 12 be all right? 
But I said, Miss Groom, you don't know anything about me. But I, she said, will that be all right with you if I offer you that for each class? I said, of course. At least that much I can try. So she said, all right, this is what we'll do. You take it on for a term. And if you find that it isn't what you want to do, that it doesn't work out, she said, I'll understand perfectly and we'll call it quits. But at least you take it on for a term. So I said, all right. So at that time, I was only then naturally teaching half day because I was only giving drawing lessons. I wasn't taking on any other classes. Kitty was doing full-time work, teaching English grammar, English literature, and composition, and so forth, mostly with the older classes. I had all grades of classes, up to the top class that was taking drawing lessons. The very first day I had to go to the school, I kept Baba's ring on my hand, I kept saying, Baba, 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 you see? Oh my God, because I was, not that I was so young, but I can still recollect back how whenever anybody came, there was a new teacher to the school, you know, and she'd be in your class, and you'd size her up, you know, how much can you get away with, and what not, and what is she going to be like, and what will our reactions be, and so forth. So I just visualize all this going on in these children's minds, and so that's what paralyzed me. So I said, Baba, I've just got to see it through. You said, get a job, and now I've got my job, and now I've got to see it through. So anyway, little by little, the thing started building up. I got the confidence of the children, and I managed to get them slowly to do what I wanted. And we'd been there for some months, and suddenly we got a letter from Baba saying that Baba was calling us. Where he was, I think, in Satara at the time. But there was one condition, and the condition was that we had to get our jobs back or we couldn't come. He didn't say for how long he was calling us, but he was calling us in a matter of weeks. But the main thing was that we had to get our jobs back. I said, Kitty, here we've just come here, we've started a term, and now we're going and saying we want to go off. What is this woman going to say? But I said, the only way we're going to know is to ask her. And so we went to her office and we said, Miss Groom, We've gotten a very important letter, and we find that we'd have to go away for some time. But, uh, of course, we'd like our jobs back when we came back. She said, of course you can go. And of course I want you to come back. There's no question that you shouldn't come back. I just sort of hung onto that desk. I said, Papa, oh. She never questioned why we had to go or how long we were going to be gone, only the fact that what's important, and she said, I know that you wouldn't ask if it wasn't important. That's the only thing she said. And so what she did was to put our workload on all these other teachers, which is an unheard of thing. Usually if you take leave, you're going to find a replacement at least for that time. Where would we have found a replacement? So instead she hands our workload to everybody. And off we go to Satara to see Baba. And we were with Baba for some weeks. And then when we came back, our workload was increased. Uh, she started giving me more classes, different classes. I was teaching first year French to some children, uh, to younger classes. And then I was giving, given literature. And then besides that, I was giving the drawing. By that time, I started doing full time. And then this went on for quite a while, and then again Baba called us. This was about, I think, the Dasra time. And uh, again she let us go without a murmur. And again she gave our workload to all the teachers. And Kitty kept in correspondence with her. And during that time, Kit, before that, Kitty had been given complete charge of one of the classrooms, you know, sort of as the have room teacher. And uh, that meant a lot of extra work because she had to keep that roll call, she had to make out all the report cards of that particular class. So Kitty and I used to sort of do a teamwork because Kitty was very particular about giving her, especially the older ones, a lot of written work because she said that's the only way they'll get the English into their heads because the Parsi children were the ones that were so clever and also some of what they call the Christian ones. But the in Hindu and Mohammedans were very weak in the English. 
So by giving this written work, you see, Kitty thought she'd get the English more. Well, that meant so many more things to correct. So I, my classes were uh, easier classes and the younger classes. So I used to help Kitty with the correcting and then she'd do the marking and then I used to fill out all our report cards and she'd just put in the remarks and sign them and all. And we did a regular teamwork and this used to impress Miss Groom very much because another thing she said when we came to the school, she said, you know, ever since you two came to the school, the whole atmosphere of the school has changed. And that's why we felt afterwards is why she wanted just to hold on to us and come back because she, she couldn't understand that here are these two women out of the blue coming there to the school and somehow, subtly, that whole atmosphere of the school was changing. We were not conscious of it, but she could feel the difference from before we were there and from the time we were there. So she used to say, How, what teamwork Kitty and I used to do? And I said, well, I mean, we've been doing like this for so long. We never talked about Bob at that time or told her anything about Bob because it was a mission school and she was very sort of, I mean, her life rose and set in Jesus, and so how could we start talking about Baba? We might upset her, so we said nothing. So, as I say, when we had that second leave to go, we went up to Mahamanishwar to be with Baba. And that was at the time when Baba was uh, stepped out of the new life for one day, for 24 hours, and then again back I mean, into the old life, and then back into the new life. So we were there at that time, and then afterwards I think there was the Diwali festival and all. So she wrote to my uh, kitty at that time, asking her if I would take on the the counterpart of her class. I mean, kitty had I think it was six B or seven B, I forget which. So would I take A? So I said, look, kitty, if I take on that whole class, I said my work will be so cut out to look after that. Besides my own classes, that I won't even be able to help you, and then we'll get ourselves into an awful muddle. I don't want the responsibility of looking after that other class. And it's much better if we carry on the way we're doing now. I can help you with what you're doing. We can get through the work, and at least everything goes smoothly, whereas the other way, we'll get over our heads with work, and, and it won't work out. So Miss Groomham accepted the, the uh, reason I said this. Gave it to one of the other teachers. So everything went smoothly. I got more and more classes. And I was working, as I say, full time then. Besides that, I was given the uh, dramatics class. And that I enjoyed immensely because from the, I'd always loved the theater, even before I came to Baba. And uh, we used to do amateur theatricals and I would always be doing the, the scenery and all that because I refused to act. And uh, so Kitty and I took uh, this uh, bit from Dickens. And uh, Kitty gave them the script for it and then I did most of the directing of, for their acting, so that they, for instance, not to turn your back on the audience and don't mumble when you're talking, and and the actions that they should put into it. Oh, they used to have a lovely time. And we had two two groups because we said, supposing one lot of the children get ill at the last minute, how are you going to train at the, uh, like that? So we we made the two groups vie with each other not telling them which was going to be the one that would be the main one to do the acting, and we would decide at the last minute. And whenever I used to ask them to rehearse after school, never once where there was a murmur of dissent. They always came enthusiastically and always put their whole heart into the acting and doing. And they used to love it when I get up and start showing them how they should do like this or should do like that. And these children really, they did a beautiful job. And I found the uh, some dresses of mine that would, would fit in for that period and a poke bonnet with a bow underneath by just take, changing the hat and bending it. And then I made them borrow their brother's suits and make four-in-hand ties. And they didn't cost the school a penny. Only to, I think, rent a beaver hat. That was the only thing that they had the expense they had to go through. And this groom does afterwards is the best thing they'd had in the school in a long time. So we felt very happy that, I mean, we'd made a success of that. Then the Christmas holiday, summer holidays came. So at that time, Baba called us again, but that was all right because it was holiday time. And when I get up there like that first time in Mamish Hard, Baba said, you've got to go back. And I said, Baba, how many times are you going to send us back like this? Why can't we stay with you? No, I said, Baba, you've got to go back. And I'd cry and cry. Baba was in the new life. That was in the new life. 
when he died, but he, uh, he said, no, the design is for a short period, and for me, you have to go back. And I said, oh, Baba, why? He said, I cry. Baba said, no, mustn't cry, you've got to go back. So then I put myself together and go. So when uh, the summer, we came again to Mamishwa to be with Baba, and uh, while we were there, Baba one day called us and said, now, I'm from here, I'm going to hide a bed. And are you so immersed in your work and satisfied with your jobs in Bombay that you want to stay there? Or do you want to come with me to Hyderabad and take your chances on getting a job in Hyderabad? Well, there was no even having to think. I said, never mind Bombay. We'll find a job somehow in Hyderabad, of course. If we have the opportunity of coming with you, where else would we want to go? Why would we want to stay in Bombay a minute longer? And uh, so Baba said, uh, all right, but you're going to have to get a job in Hyderabad. I said, somehow or other, Baba will find a job in Hyderabad. So it happened that Nagish, Anavaz's sister, was taking care of somebody's child up there in Mahamnishwa. And uh, these people had rented the Nizams of Hyderabad's bungalow. And there was some official from the Nizams cabinet that had come there to the bungalow. And how she managed to tell us about that, I forget, but we got permission from Baba to go over there and meet this man on the strength that possibly he might have some entree where we could, you know, get a job there in, in Hyderabad. So we met him and explained our situation. Because uh, we later asked, when we went back to the school, we'd asked Miss Groom if they had any connection with any school in Hyderabad, and she said no, she had no connection whatsoever. So anyway, we made the contact with this man. He said, I'll do what I can. And I said, that's all, we've done our best now. We'll wait till we get to Hyderabad. So Kitty and I started planning out, you know, what routes we'd take and the buses and so on and so forth. But one thing that... Uh, Kitty said to Baba that Miss Groom had been so amazing in her uh, acceptance of us and not objecting any time to our going off that now that we were definitely leaving, we should at least go back and spend two months there and give her the opportunity of getting replacements for us and not just leaving her in the lurch by just walking out like that. And Baba agreed, said yes, but you must be back by a certain date. I think it was the end of July, something like that. That would have given us June and July because the school started in June again. So we went back to school. Now, that time, Baba said, you're not to stay at Meiji's. And uh, uh, Masi and Koshi were not staying at Meiji's. So where can you stay? So I said, well, at, at the school, there's an upstairs where Miss Groom lives. And I said, there are a couple of the other teachers who live there. And I think there's an extra room there. So Baba said, you inquire. So we went there. There was the extra room, a lovely big double room with a veranda. We had all sorts of service, you know, early morning tea, the way that the British have, and delicious meals, and, and as I say, excellent service. And it was so reasonable, being this mission school. And it was during the monsoon months, so that meant there would be no notebooks and catching of buses and standing in the rain or anything like that. I mean, how Baba just took care of everything every time. So we went and we moved there at the school and stayed there those last two months of the school. So when it came to the, our leaving and the class and the children heard that we were, were leaving, oh my, there was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and oh, 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 oh I mean, what are we going to do without Miss Davy and what are we going to do without Miss Gailey and oh, they were so upset. They wouldn't even come down to morning prayers that morning when, they, when their class heard. Then this groom and the other teachers had to go up. The whole class was in hysterics. It was fantastic. And they used to love to tell me what the things Miss Davy had done. He used to, Do you know what Miss Davy did today, you know? And then they'd tell me about some fantastic thing Kitty had done. <laughs> and, they'd some and they loved Kitty, our class today. They were really sweet. All of them were really... I got, uh, I got very fond of them. Even though I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my life being a teacher. I mean, I really got into it while I was there. And so when it came to the fact that now we're leaving, I said, look, Kitty, we've got to tell Miss Groom about Baba. 
Because I said there's no, there's no other way that, I mean, anybody who has done what she has done for us must know why she's done it. And uh, Kitty said, but Miss Groom, I mean, this, uh, you know, mission school and this and that. Somehow I said, we manage, we have to. I said, up to now, I haven't said anything. I've agreed with you. We mustn't disturb the things and we don't want to, what is the expression, proselytize there, the school or anything. So at least now we'll have to do something. So how it worked out was that Miss Groom's sister was on a visit there. And she was just idle, had nothing much to do. Ramon, the fact that her sister was still working there. And as a matter of fact, Miss Groom was still there only for the fact that she had not been able to get a replacement from England. She was waiting for somebody to come. And so that's why she was still staying on, otherwise she would have had a replacement. And she would not have been there. So I just felt all the time that Barbara just kept her there for us, because who else would have done for us what she did without any question whatsoever? Because actually, one time, there was going to be some inspector coming about something. And she said, now, Miss Gailey, don't you be so diffident with him. I said, Miss Groom, I won't be diffident with anybody from outside like that. But I said, with you, I had to lay my cards on the table. Why should I let you engage me under the pretext that I knew this, that, and the other thing when I didn't? If you were willing to take me when you knew the situation, that's another matter. But you needn't fear. I won't be diffident uh, with somebody else outside. So anyway, to go back to... The sister, she was rather lonely because Miss Groom was always so busy. So we used to invite her to come in and have tea with us in the evening after school. So little by little, I worked in Baba, showed her Baba books, Baba's photo I had on the dressing table and everything. Then tell her, I told her about how we had this master, and that's why we'd come to Bombay, and he told us to get jobs and so forth. Knowing perfectly well that in the evening she'd be going to repeat it all to Miss Groom. Which, sure enough, she did. I mean, Miss Groom, naturally, we used to see her at dinner time. In the evening, there would be prayers, and then we'd go to our room, and then we'd be up to 12 o'clock at night uh, correcting notebooks and things. So I knew that the only person that could get get near to Miss Groom to tell her about this, that had the time to tell her, would be the sister. So, sure enough, Miss, uh, I forget what her name was, uh, the sister, she told Miss Groom all about uh, what she had been hearing from us. So one day I was uh, upstairs in our room. Kitty had gone out. She was, at the time, we were saving all our money to take to Baba because in the days when we were, were living with Mirji, all our uh, salary and everything had to go to Homai. We were not allowed to keep a cent. But once we were staying there at the school, the money was all ours, so we could sp spend as little or as much as we wanted. So naturally, as much as we could, we were saving to give to Baba. So Kitty was also, and I had done, uh, taken some extra tutoring jobs. So that day, particular day, Kitty was out. So the servant comes up and said, Miss Groom wanted to see me. So I went down, realizing immediately what she wanted. So I went down and I said, yes, Miss Groom, and she said, oh, my sister's been telling me such interesting things. And I said, do you mean about Meha Baba? She said, yes. So then I proceeded to tell her that how we had come to know Baba and that we were following him as our master, and that's why we had come to India to be with him. But now he was on a tour and he had told us to go to Bombay and uh, take a job. And then she had so graciously offered the job in the school and that our whole life was devoted to him and whatever his wishes were, naturally, we followed. And uh, that's why I said when uh, we got those calls to go and leave the school, I said he had sent for us and that naturally whatever Baba's wish was that we would abide by. So when he called us and he gave us uh, the permission to go, then uh, we... Uh, that is why we went and why we had to leave you this number of times. And I said, the best way I can describe Baba to you is by telling you that he has all the Christ qualities. Because I thought if I tell her he's Christ, or even Mayor Baba didn't mean anything to her, but the fact that Baba had the Christ qualities practically was implying that Baba, you know, was as Christ is. So that somehow appealed to her and she could understand. She said, yes, he must be a very wonderful person. And she wanted to hear more about him and I showed her pictures of Baba and she was quite interested. But I said, Miss Groom, you're the remarkable person. I said, you took us, we had no reference of any kind. You took us on faith. She said, but I live on faith. 
And so, I mean, really, I mean, I'm so glad because she really had an understanding of what it meant for us to follow Baba and to do, and yet somehow or other she appreciated that we put as much effort as we possibly could in the school because we used to go and help her there on a Saturday. We'd go and straighten down her cellar with all our cupboards where everything was higgledy-piggledy and odd things like that we used to try to do to for her and help. And she appreciated that because, I mean, she is all, all the work herself. And uh, so uh, just after that then... We left. She seems to be the uh, just the right person Baba had placed. She there. was. She because was. Because you were living right on the edge of the new life.